So in this video, we're going to be talking about the first period of Roman history under the kings. So this is, uh, this is known as the regal period. It lasts up until the kings are cast out. Uh, the story that the Romans have um, about their origins involves a series of kings that, according to their legends, uh, you know, set up the main institutions of Roman society. Uh, and so a couple of things to note about this. First of all, the Roman idea of the king is very much in accordance with what we call a priest king. Um, even more so than somebody like Gilgamesh, for example, um, if you remember what we have said about the role of religion in, in the Roman state, the fact that consultation of the gods is absolutely crucial in advance of every important action. Um, the religion is, is fully integrated into the Roman state, so much so that the, um, that, uh, the state religion is uh, is a a separate uh, set of beliefs and ideas compared to the way religion is observed, you know, out in the fields amongst um, you know ordinary peasants, uh, and so the uh, you know part of the primary job of the Roman king is to interact with the gods and to ensure. Uh, that uh, the, 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 the gods and the city of Rome have a positive relationship. Many of the duties of the Roman king involve uh, you know, key religious rituals that can only be conducted by the king. And so um, you know, the one signifier of this is, for example, the model that we're looking at, uh, the, the regia, the house of the king, is in it is in fact not the king's uh, you know private residence, but the place in which the king conducted his business, which is primarily uh, rituals uh, uh, that are part of his government of the of the Roman state. And so, the other thing that's important about the kings is that we know about them only very indirectly and very uh, unreliably. The information that we have about the first several centuries of Roman history comes from much later. The, the Romans do not have a tradition of recording their own history uh, um, you know, in, in the earliest periods, during the Regal period, the early Republic, uh, except in a couple of, uh, in a couple of, 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 of very specific ways. Uh, one is that the priests would record important events on a yearly calendar so that they could have a sense of which days were lucky and unlucky. The Romans conducted business uh, as much as possible only on days that, uh, you know, on which a terrible disaster had not befallen the Romans. And so we have, you know, this very sparse record of, you know, major events, uh, you know, uh, officials that have been, uh, you know, elected and, uh, you know, earthquakes, natural disasters, wars begun and ended, uh, important laws passed, but without uh, context, uh, without a great deal of information about anything other than the, the bare necessities of these events. The other way in which uh, stories of, of early Roman life are recorded is each individual family would, would have records of its most important ancestors. And these would be useful on, on uh, ceremonial occasions, most especially at funerals. Uh, noble families, when they have a funeral of an important member, uh, they, would have, they would actually hire actors to wear a mask of the important ancestors. And the, and the ancestor would come to the funeral and say, I am so-and-so, I am the ancestor of the deceased, and, you know, I was consul in this date, and I won a great victory on this date, and I had a triumph, uh, and uh, I contributed to the greatness of Rome and to the greatness of this family, of this clan. Uh, as you might imagine, these family records uh, tend to embellish the uh, the deeds and importance of their ancestors. The further back you go, the more so these stories are are likely to be, you know, mere uh, legends that uh, that uh, that are uh, are uh, suspect to some degree. And so, as a result, uh, the the stories that we have about the the beginnings of Rome 
that the Romans themselves had were the stories that they had always told themselves, the legends that had come down to them over the centuries from their, uh, from their ancestors. Uh, and uh, the way in which the, the kings are represented is in a very schematic way. Each of the seven kings uh, is sort of responsible for creating a particular aspect of Roman society. But there are certain things we can say about the regal period, that, uh, that some key aspects of Roman society developed during this period. The importance of family and clan is uh, is absolutely vital uh, legacy of the of the regal period uh, the period of the kings uh, the importance of the of the census the the way in which the the Romans uh, uh, conducted the the uh, the creation of an army was through a levy a draft and this was done according to your class according to the amount of wealth that you own so, you know, the Romans would conduct a census of, uh, of the entire citizen body and would rank its members according to their membership in one of five classes. And those in the wealthiest class were, um, uh, were given the role of heavy infantry and cavalry because they could afford the equipment of heavy infantry. Uh, the second class, also heavy infantry. Third class, lighter infantry. Uh, uh, you know, and you know, down to the fifth class, which is uh, rear support, this kind of thing. Uh, the membership in each class conditions what role you play in society, uh, because the the army is is the primary organizing principle of Rome, going all the way back to the regal period, uh, and and so. The conduct of the census is vitally important. The membership in these five classes is vitally important. Anybody who doesn't have enough property to make the minimum requirement to belong to the fifth class is, uh, is not uh, enumerated, is not, uh, uh, is not listed in the roles of citizens. All that they do is count the number of people that fall into this category. This is a very large category of people. And... Uh, uh, this this headcount, this proletariat, this group of, of citizens who either have no property or amongst the skilled laborers that are living in the city of Rome or have very, very small amounts of property and are just barely getting by, uh, surviving uh, by, by growing enough to feed their family. You know, these lowest ranked citizens are... Uh, uh, you know, are, are you know, become a, a key factor in the in the story of Rome as it develops because they are excluded from the political process to a very large extent. They're still citizens; they still get a vote. But we'll see in the assembly how the the uh, the political process is skewed toward the wealthy and to the disadvantagement of the poor. A number of later institutions find their origins in the regal period, we'll talk about later. Uh, and the pomerium, uh, this is a key concept. This is the sacred boundary of the city of Rome. This is created during the regal period. And uh, the pomerium is vitally important because the, the Romans tend to think about uh, events and actions, uh, political, military, social, in terms of either what's within the boundaries of Rome or beyond it. And... Uh, uh, and everything that's within the bounds of Rome is is domestic, is political. Everything that's outside the boundary of Rome is military. And so this is the Roman mindset from the very beginning. The pomerium is the divider between us and them. And the way in which them is dealt with is primarily in terms of defense and, if necessary, aggression. And this carries on all the way through to the, the story of the Roman Empire. Uh, the, the Romans, what matters to the Romans is, is the city of Rome within its sacred boundaries. Even once Rome comes to govern the entire territory of the, of the Mediterranean, and it becomes this vast empire, it's still always Rome and everything else. Uh, what matters to the Romans is the city of Rome. And if this includes the political process, uh, at the end of the day, the, the people who rule over the empire that creates, the, their political function is to be the, the ruler of the city of Rome.
the first of the kings is, uh, is according to Roman legends, is Romulus, and uh, you know we have no way of knowing even whether a person such as Romulus actually existed. But for our purposes, what matters is what the Romans credited to Romulus, what the Romans thought about their own founder, and how that gives us insight into the Romans themselves. Uh, Romulus was, uh, according to legend, abandoned as a child and raised by a wolf, uh, and 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 came to. Uh, see Rome as uh, uh, as both an extension of the uh, the other cities that had been founded before it, and as something apart. Where uh, in order to survive, you have to uh, fight to establish yourself. After because you know you know the the story of having been abandoned means that you're essentially on your own, and uh, you know the, the having been raised by a wolf uh, gives you the characteristics of. Of a wolf in terms of uh, of of, uh, of independence, in terms of of defending what is yours and aggression where necessary, and so the Romans take this very much to heart. Um, even you know, despite the fact that the stories of, of Romulus, the Romans themselves are aware, are not uh, you know entirely salubrious, and uh, there are a number of, of stories associated with Romulus. Uh, involving doing what is necessary in order to create a future for Rome. Most famously, the capture of the Sabine women, in which Romulus sets up a festival in which the, the neighboring communities are invited. During the course of the festival, the, the maidens are abducted and married to uh, Romans, because the Romans are desperately in need of women, having been this community of outcasts. And, and uh, the story goes that you know the next day the 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 neighbor, the, the men realize uh, of the communities neighboring communities realize that women folk are missing, uh, and they they assemble into an army to fight the Romans, and uh, the the women that had been captured and married to the Romans go out into the battlefield between the armies and stop the war and say, uh, you know you cannot wage war against our husbands. Um, you know, we are now, our, our destiny, however this came about, our destiny is now in with the lot of Rome. And the, the only solution is for our communities to, to merge and for us all to share a common destiny. So, A, this carries over, you know, the, the essential idea that, uh, a, you know, the, the, a, when a marriage occurs, the daughter passes from the membership of the family of the father into the family of the husband. The families being of paramount importance, families being more important than the individual. This means that you know the, the woman, ha the, the role of the woman, the function of the woman has passed from you know her uh, um, supporting the family that she came from to supporting the family that she's married into. Uh, and uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of, of aspects of this that, uh, that, you know, that illustrate the, the, the public role of women, which is, in a way, the same as the public role of men, to support the family, to demonstrate and, and act the uh, you know, function that you have, whether you are a male or a female, is, in, is, is toward the reputation and standing of the family that you belong to. The other thing about this is there are a number of, of legends from early Rome that have to do with women that demonstrate the importance that Romans place on women symbolically. Uh, uh, and we'll come back to this uh, in a, in, in later on, but the idea is that, that women for, for Romans represent purity. Uh, and so you know, this leaves the men to be, uh, to, to be violent uh, in their dealings with others. Uh, as long as the purity of women are protected and preserved, uh, this is uh, you know all of these aspects are, are 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 sort of institutionalized under the second king Numa. Numa is uh, according to legend responsible for establishing uh, all of the institutions of the Roman religion. And again, this is legend; we can't count on this being true. Uh, but you know, Numa. Uh, you know, whereas Romulus was warlike and fierce and in creating, carving out a future for the city of Rome, uh, politically and socially, 
uh, Numa carves out a, a future for the city of Rome in its relationship with the gods. And uh, the, the, you know, the legacy of Numa is, is the public role of priests in, uh, in you know, working hand in hand with uh, the, the Roman political system uh, and uh, you know, ensuring you know, the, the religious aspects of a number of Roman beliefs. And uh, so this includes the creation of the college of, uh, colleges of various kinds of priests and uh, the, the establishment of the Vestal Virgins, whose job it is to, uh, A, remain pure, uh, uh, which is to say chaste, uh, and throughout their lives, and B, to maintain the eternal flame, which is housed within the, the temple of the Vestal Virgins. Uh, and, you know, these two things are very closely related. The eternal flame represents the, 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 uh, the endless destiny that the Romans have, the permanent and perpetual strength of the Romans. And this is guarded not by warriors, but by pure women. Uh, and so the, the symbolism, you know, the importance of, of virginity, and uh, once virginity is, is, uh, is removed, the importance of the, the Roman matron, the married woman, in Roman society in protecting the, 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 the family and the, the community. So the pure maiden and the, uh, the responsible matron, both of these are vitally important to the Roman conception of, of themselves uh, uh, and, uh, and, and their, their future as a society. Jumping ahead to the last King Tarquin, uh, by the time we get to the seventh King Tarquin, uh, Tarquin is, uh, is, is demonstrating all the things that go wrong when you have one man who's elevated above, above all the others. Superbus actually in, in Latin means, uh, you know, above others in an arrogant way. Uh, this is, you know, Tarquin Superbus is, you know, Tarquin the, the jerk, Tarquin the arrogant. Uh, and, you know, so everything that could go wrong is associated with Tarquin. He seizes power as a usurper, um, and uh, he abuses his position and, uh, and acts as if he's better than everyone else. Um, you know, he undertakes a number of, uh, you know, of important reforms and, and helps to establish the strength of the Roman community. But his, uh, his selfishness and arrogance spells doom for the, the kingship itself. Uh, this comes to play in in his son, uh, who is, the legend is, is told of how he, uh, uh, you know, very arrogantly plays a game in which, uh, with his buddies, in which he chooses the most virtuous of the, the Roman women, and uh, in order to demonstrate his own power and position, uh, he rapes her. This is the rape of Lucretia. The rape of Lucretia is you know, the ultimate crime for the Romans, the violation of a, a woman, a violation of a, a virginal uh, woman who represents the, uh, the, the purity of Rome and, and the sanctity of its future. Uh, and, uh, you know, as a result of the rape of Lucretia, the entirety of the kingship is discredited, that kingship should come to this. It's not just that Tarquin and his son are, uh, are, are deposed and, and exiled, um, this is this is what actually happens, but the the, the Romans are so repulsed by this story, uh, by the the extremeness of the crime, that kingship itself is abolished, and the Romans establish a re republic. And from and the, the 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 key idea of the republic, the very meaning of the republic, is that no one man should be allowed to stand above the rest of the noble families. And, uh, uh, and this is the guiding principle of the Republic. The, uh, from this point onward, everything about the Republic is, de is, is, is uh, set up to ensure that there should never again be a possibility of someone so arrogant, so secure in his ability to repress uh, and, and subjugate. Um, that he should stand amongst the Romans, and this is this is the the uh, the the core, the bones of the Republic for the next five hundred years. Key values that come out of this period that that influence Rome's future. Uh, 
the idea of, of virtus, what it means to be a man. Uh, the Roman word for, the Latin word for man is weir, uh, V-I-R. And, uh, and, and so virtus is what it means to be a man. And this is ultimately to be uh, uh, everything that is the opposite of Tarquin's purpose. Uh, to be a man is to be uh, not seeking of glory, to be abstemious, to be, uh, uh, to be um, you know, rejecting of of glory and uh, and 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 luxury and indulgence, uh, and all of these things are identified with the decadent East. The Romans uh, see the, the the wealthy communities of uh, well of the Etruscans and also of the Greeks and the other peoples to the East, uh, people lying around and and uh, indulging in their wealth and and you know doing all these other things. Uh, that uh, don't contribute to um, to society in, a, in an actionable way. Uh, they see this as, as decrepit, as, as decadent, uh, and uh, you know, as as, uh, uh, as 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 demeaning to a man. And so, to be a man is to be able to go to war, to be able to conduct himself um, not on behalf of his of his own interest, but on the on behalf of the interests of his family and of his community. Uh, pietas means uh, loyalty to one's family, to one's father, to one's ancestors. Uh, to uh, to be pious in Latin is uh, is to be uh, respectful and loyal to the members of your family that had come before you. Uh, the reason why pious means loyal to God in English is that later in the Middle Ages. Uh, it was appropriated uh, to uh, God the Father, and so uh, you know the, you, you know your your loyalty in Christian in Christian terms needs to be to your ultimate Father, but it, amongst the, the Romans, to be pious is to be uh, to be loyal and subservient to your your own uh, actual Father and to the ancestors that came before him. Uh, fides means loyalty and, and respect to any relationship that you have, to your brethren in military service, uh, to your political leaders, uh, to your friends, to not betray the people that have your trust. Uh, uh, gravitas and constantia, to, to, uh, to, be, uh, to be sober, uh, you know, in, in the sort of emotional sense, and to be consistent, to be reliable, to be trustworthy. All of these things are things that the Romans, um, you know, believe uh, fundamentally to be necessary to the success of their community. Uh, remember that the Romans are, you know, starting out as a newcomer amongst the Latins, and the Latins themselves are newcomers compared to the Etruscans and the Greeks that are much older civilizations. Um, the Romans know that in order to, uh, you know, in order to survive, they have to you, they have to be powerful and strong as families and as a community. They can't indulge in, in meaningless idleness. Uh, they have to give themselves over to, the, to their society and to their clan. And so all of what the, the Romans believe is important about being a man or a woman uh, is, um, is embedded in society from a very early point. Um, they disrespect luxury, uh, wealth, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, and and all of these things that um, that that are suspicious, that can undermine service to the community and the building of, of a community strong enough to withstand uh, enemies that will come for them from all of their surrounding uh, uh, all of their surrounding civilizations. Uh, and autoritas is. Is the is the respect that you earn from the service that you provide to your family and community? Octoritas is is the the influence that you are able to gain through being a good citizen and a good leader. And so this is in contrast to glory, which is self-serving. Um, the Romans are suspicious of glory because it singles out individuals. But autoritas is, you know, is the respect that you've, you've earned as a person because of the things that you've done for Rome and for your clan. 
all these things are bound together as, as, as being the ways of our ancestors, the mos maiorum. This is probably the most important term uh, from Roman history that you'll want to pick up on, the mos maiorum, the ways of our ancestors. And there's, a, there's sort of a, a dual meaning built into this term because maior, maior it refers to uh, you know, the people that came before, but it also means, uh, it's also a word that means better. And so there's a sense that the, our ancestors were better than us, were, you know, were more dedicated than us, were more virtuous more than us, more pious than us, more loyal than us. Uh, and so the most maior becomes you know, this standard for how Romans are. And whenever people feel like they're falling short of this, it's the standard for how we should be. Uh, and there's much talk about the most maiorum as, as uh, the, the Republic progresses and eventually starts to fall apart 500 years later. And we'll see how, uh, how that story, you know, uh, carries on, the, the meaning of what it means to be Roman uh, as we continue for now, that's that.